Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Preposterous. That is how a former federal judge described the Justice Department's move last month to dismiss the charges against President Trump's first national security advisor, Michael Flynn. In an amicus brief filed today, retired judge John Gleason offered a scathing rebuke of the Justice Department's contradictory and legally unsound arguments and recommended that the judge overseeing Michael Flynn's case deny the government's request and move to sentence Michael Flynn for twice pleading guilty to lying to the FBI. John Gleason said that the Justice Department was engaging in what he called highly irregular conduct that was corrupt and politically motivated. He wrote, the facts surrounding the filing of the government's motion constitute clear evidence of gross prosecutorial abuse. They reveal an unconvincing effort to disguise as legitimate a decision to dismiss that is based solely on the fact that Flynn is a political ally of President Trump. John Gleason said that Attorney General William Barr's Justice Department has, quote, abdicated its responsibility to prosecute cases fairly. He wrote, it has treated the case like no other, and in doing so has undermined the public's confidence in the rule of law. Joining our discussion now is Matt Miller, a former spokesperson for the Attorney General, Eric Holder, and an MSNBC contributor. Uh, Matt, your reaction to this extraordinary filing in this case? I think extraordinary is the right word. It really was a, a detailed and devastating rebuttal to the argument the Justice Department uh, has been making. Uh, you know, the, Judge Gleason was really trying to answer two questions. One, uh, does the judge in this case have the authority to reject the department's attempt to dismiss this case? And two, if he has the authority, should he? And, and the conclusion he came to is that usually judges should defer to the Justice Department. The ju Justice Department just gets to decide who to prosecute, who not to prosecute. But in a case where the, the Justice Department is acting so transparently corrupt and so, when their actions are so obviously politically motivated, for the judge to just defer to them would implicate the judge himself in the Justice Department's corruption. And so he, not only does he have the authority, but that he should exercise that authority and just move to sentence Michael Flynn. Uh, as you read it, you can feel just how astounded Gleason is at what he's uncovering in this. Uh, and he sh says that Flynn committed perjury in his attempt uh, to change course in this case. Uh, but the judge should just factor that in when he's sentencing him. Uh, so could the scenario be that the judge goes forward, sentences Michael Flynn, and then Donald Trump uh, pardons Michael Flynn? Or will Donald Trump intervene before the judge chooses to sentence Michael Flynn. You know, uh, the president could intervene at any point, but there's one other possibility, and that is that the, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, where Michael Flynn's lawyer went to try to get them to sort of yank this out of uh, Judge Sullivan's hands and, and intervene in the case, they may take it out of out of Judge Sullivan's hands. It, 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 um, Judge Sullivan drew a, an unfortunate panel, the, the two, two, I think, pretty good allies of the president on that panel. We don't know what the full circuit would rule if it ever got to them, but it's possible that, that Judge Sullivan will never even be allowed to rule on this case. But if so, look, 
I think ultimately we all know that the president would pardon Mike Flynn, but I think the point that that uh, Judge Gleason was making in his in, in his argument today, look, the president can can pardon him and suffer the political consequences, but if he wants to do that, he needs to do it transparently. He needs to step forth and give him the pardon and pay the price for that, not try to to, to fly under the radar and in the name of justice. Uh, make make a transparently self-serving and transparently political argument through the Justice Department, as as uh, the Attorney General did in this case. Well, the, the challenge for Flynn may be that Donald Trump uh, might only have a few months left in his presidency uh, to issue this pardon. Uh, the morning of January 20th might be the last minute, and the process that we're in now uh, might not be completed uh, by that time. It, it might not be completed by that time, and I suspect uh, the same with, with uh, the same with Roger Stone. I suspect before Mike Flynn ever sees the inside of a jail cell, whether it's January twentieth or whether sometime before that, uh, the president will intervene and pardon him. It, it, he's sent all the signals in the world that that's what he intends to do. Bill Barr's trying to let him off the hook and do it for him, but if he's unsuccessful, I, I think you're right. The president will intervene at some point. It is Thursday, the eleventh of June of twenty twenty. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Oh, my. Well, uh, I guess we have gone down a perilous road in the great experiment we call America. Oh my, did you read? Did you hear? Apparently some leaked documents have been uh, released, well leaked, and uh, shows that apparently the National Guard and the military have bullets on pallets labeled by state for use against Americans in a time of an emergency like right now. Yeah, they have bullets on pallets to kill Americans. And then in Georgia, they didn't have enough ballots for people to vote. How is that possible? I'll tell you how it's possible. Because when you got bullets on pallets by state to kill Americans, why do you need ballots? The choice has been made. And uh, we weren't part of the choice. Sorry. That's how experiments work now, doesn't it? Especially when you're fudging the numbers for the results you want. Yeah, if uh, some people would just like the great experiment uh, play out instead of, you know, manipulating it, fudging it, we wouldn't be in this authoritarian uh, precipice we are now. Isn't that nice? So, uh, Trump is going to go to Tulsa. He's going to have his first hate rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to celebrate white people reopening Tulsa in 1921. You know, they had a terrible thing happen. And uh, fortunately, they were able to reopen because of grit and determination. When you're terraforming a whole city like Tulsa, and, and you know, you got to burn it to the ground. Make sure every virus has been immolated. So in the process, I don't know if tens of thousands of black uh, Tulsans lose their homes and businesses. Well, that's the price that has to be paid. Okay, so they rebuilt Tulsa after that terrible thing that happened. They never talk about the terrible thing, but Tulsa was rebuilt. And did you know about the Tulsa race riots before the 1619 project or even even before uh, uh, that TV show, that HBO show? I'm all of a sudden drawing a blank. We did. Yeah. When I say we, there were some of us who actually had a fairly comprehensive public school education. Granted, I did begin my education in a parochial school called the Catholic religion. Yeah, they had a whole school system set up. It was actually quite comprehensive, taught you critical thinking to the point, well, sometimes you didn't want to be a Catholic anymore, because what was the use? <laughs> Catholic it does mean universal, you know. Anyway, um, 
We learned about the Tulsa race riots back in the day. Of course, I was fortunate to have a historian, a professional historian, as a father. So I, I was privy to a lot of things that you would normally get. Like the black cowboy. Did you know that the cowboy, originally they were blacks? Because there was no white guy who would allow anyone to call them a boy. The only cowboys were black guys who were uh, good with horses because that's what they did. I mean, they were the go-to to train horses. And uh, they were called cowboys. So, uh, but how many people learn, you know, just about the black cowboy in the West? Not much. But we did learn about the Tulsa race riots back in the day. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly juxtaposed with what Gandhi was doing in a similar time frame, surprisingly. Isn't that weird? Anyway, uh, when you have a military campaign to terraform a whole town and you need a mob to do it, it's, you know, you have some ready-made soldiers for you right now. (laughs) Right then, too. And right now. (laughs) So... Bullets or ballots? Do we really have a choice? Trump is saying that his supporters will demand that he serves more than two terms. Well, there's a lot of non-supporters. In fact, I would say even more non-supporters demand that he be Frog March to Leavenworth right now. And I would pro- proffer that after he served his term at Leavenworth, then he goes to The Hague. And he stands trial there, and come what may... I know we have to change our our rules to allow Americans to be uh, subjected to the rule of law because we're so exceptional. Yeah. Uh, this autonomous zone in Seattle is being derided as some sort of weird commie dictatorial thing. No violence. No cops allowed. No violence. Weird. So uh, it just goes to show that Maybe America doesn't want to be an intersection in Fallujah. I don't think America wants to be. And America's saying, hey, (laughs) look, you know, how much more do you want us to believe that this is not happening? Bill Barr says, oh, there's no systemic racism in the cops. Come on. Their whole reason to tet is because of racism. Come on, Bill. You know about the slave patrols. I know you want to minimize that aspect of it. But still, Bill, you cover it up for Iran-Contra. You were right there in Watergate. The end of it, I know. But still, Bill, do you really think you're going to get away with it? You're going to get John mitchell You think you're above the law? You think you have a little-known secret? That's how how little-known it is. It's secret. (laughs) <laughs> OLC memo in his back pocket. Maybe it's actually over his heart. That's a get out of jail free card. Bill, this is not the game of Monopoly. I know you've been acting as if it is. But Bill, <laughs> you're not going to even be able to own Baltic Avenue. Not one little domicile. Not one. Okay, what's on the rest of the menu here? Well, Bill Barr was taken to task by retired Judge John Gleason, tasked with diving into the Flynn matter, and he called Barr's move to drop the case corrupt and a gross abuse of prosecutorial power. Well, my God, that's Bill Barr's reason to test, isn't it? Indeed. On the rest of the menu, Trump refuses to blame violence on far-right extremists who have been arrested for far-right extremist violence. Because there's there's some good people there. Good people. Dapper, too. A majority of Americans want abortion to remain safe and legal, but the far-right extremists on the Supreme Court don't care. And volunteers are working with the Smithsonian to save the White House fence protest art. Yeah, before it's destroyed by Trump and his minions. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where universally despised outgoing U.S. ambassador to Germany, Richard Grinnell, defended Trump's troop withdrawal plan everyone thinks is idiocy. 
And a project to name a Polish military base Fort Trump has been toppled and dragged mercilessly. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the rightish of the page is our chat room link right there by the social media scroll. The chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And that is there because even though how we fund this little powerhouse of resistance uh, you know, from our own wallets, we would be unable to do this without you and your generosity over almost 10 years now of continuous 24-7, 365 resistance radio broadcasting has allowed us to pay our bills, fly under the radar, and continue with that resistance radio. Thank you. If you could afford... An espresso-type coffee drink, send that money our way. We are able to stretch those dollars on the quantum level. Did you know there's another quantum element that was just discovered in space? Well, we've been utilizing it even before its discovery. That's right. Things only exist when you can measure them, according to quantum scientists. Or or maybe it's just the mechanics. Uh, But we are able to stretch those dollars on the quantum level. Unbelievably so, we leave no strange quark unturned. So thank you for your generosity. I hate to say this, but I'm going going to. Please keep it up. Please. Times are tough, I know. Oh, God, will we ever get back to normalcy? Not in my lifetime, alas. But until then, we are going to maintain, maintain some sort of normalcy, and part of that is paying our bills. We're not going to give up on that. You know, paying your bills is like shaving. If you don't do it every day, you're a bum. At least that's how this redneck here thinks about it, liberal though he be. Well, if you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, please do, at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. I take care of at Justice Putnam, and I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's and get that linked up on social media where you can find uh, those show notes and links diary. Diaries linked up on uh, Twitter at Justice Putnam and at Networks Radio, too. Just, you know, maybe even uh, uh, at Cookbook West where you can follow the show. And if you'd like to pick up podcasts, please do. <laughs> you can find them at Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., 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 etc. All right, let's dive into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Josh Israel of the American Independent brings us this first offering. Right wing, <laughs> right wing extremists. Yes, I'll get it out have been reported to have engaged in or tried to provoke violence at protests around the country in the wake of the killing of unarmed black Minneapolis resident George Floyd by a white policeman. Donald Trump has ignored them, instead blaming any violence on anti-fascists. Wow. You know, anti-fascism is bad, bad in America, apparently. I didn't know. The memory of George Floyd is being dishonored by rioters, looters, and anarchists, Trump White explained. I, I, I add the editorial. Don't blame Josh Israel for this, please. Well, he White explained in late May, the violence and vandalism is being led by Antifa and other radical left-wing groups. Oh, you mean like the Catholic worker? 
that nonviolent group where people allow themselves almost to be pushed too hard. He allowed himself, you know, it was, wasn't as bad as it looked. You know, he faked that whole thing. The blood coming out of his ear. Wow. You know, Hollywood can do that, and they do it all the time. It's Antifa and the radical left, he tweeted on May 30th. Don't lay the blame on others. Because those dapper Nazis, you know, they're very fine people. And if he doesn't have the dapper Nazis to do the dirty work, who will? On June 1st, Trump retweeted and endorsed a Fox News segment that there were no white supremacist groups mixing in as a protest and that it was all an Antifa organization. Now, I'll ask this question one more time. How is it that, you know, these little neo-Nazi brown shirts at Turning Point USA can start chapters in every college campus around America, but you can never find the Antifa Club president. Why is that? And you would think the kids would do that. Let's have an Antifa Club. They don't have Antifa Clubs because Antifa is not an organization. People ask me if I'm Antifa, and I say I'm anti-fascist. Isn't every red-blooded American, comrade? Trump claimed in a tweet on May 31st that the United States would be designating anti-fascists a domestic terrorist organization because that's what Nazis do, right? Even though there's no legal mechanism for making such a declaration, and Antifa is not an organization. Court records and other files show little evidence that Antifa-aligned protesters are behind violence occurring at protests. There have, however, been numerous examples of far-right extremists attacking protesters and attempting to provoke violent clashes because we live in the basketball rule. And you know what that rule is? Whoever commits the second foul in retaliation gets called for the foul. On Sunday, a man who identified himself as a KKK leader drove a truck into a crowd of peaceful protesters in Henrico County, Virginia. The man was arrested and charged with several felonies. The county is considering hate crime charges as well, but you know Trump will just pardon him because that's what he does for the dapper Nazis and those very fine people. The accused, by his own admission and by a cursory glance at social media, is an admitted leader of the Ku Klux Klan and a propagandist for Confederate ideology, or maybe that's ideology now. Enrico Commonwealth's attorney Shannon Taylor said, On June 1st, NBC News reported that the white nationalist group Identity Europa, posing as an anti-fascist national organization, posted tweets urging protesters to go to white residential neighborhoods to take what is ours. On May 31st, three Nevada men with ties to the right-wing anti-government boogaloo movement were arrested on terror charges. Prosecutors said they were planning to provoke violence during protests in Las Vegas. On May 30th, several people in Minneapolis reported that they saw a man with a far-right anti-government group's logo on his truck attempt to set a liquor store on fire, but they were but he was stopped. By who? Anti-fascists, of course. On May 28th, a neo-Nazi reportedly attempted to exploit a racial justice protest by posting anti-police rhetoric online, including an image of a skull and the words, the only good cop is a dead cop. The same day, a far-right channel on the messaging platform Telegram reportedly broadcast to its 2,500 members that a riot would be a perfect place to commit a murder. The White House did not respond to a request for comment for this story, because obviously everyone knows the media is the enemy of the people.
Lisa Needham of the American Independent brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Anti-abortion lawmakers have made concerted efforts thus far in 2020 to implement more bans and restrictions on the medical procedure, but those efforts may have been in vain when it comes to changing people's minds. According to a new CBS poll published on Monday, a large majority of people in the country still support abortion rights. As the country awaits a Supreme Court decision and a case that could radically reshape the availability of abortion, the poll found that 63% of Americans support keeping Roe v. Wade intact. Almost half, 49% of self-identified Republicans, agree with that view as well. The poll was taken in advance of the Supreme Court decision in June Medical Services LLC v. Russo, a major case looking at abortion restrictions. As the current Supreme Court ends on the 30th of June, a decision is expected before then. But some states have not been waiting on the Supreme Court to help them ban abortion. The beginning of the year saw a spate of so-called born-alive abortion bills, which conservatives have argued are necessary to protect children who may be born during an abortion. Well, it sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? Well, there's not much science, but it is complete fiction. And uh, experts have said these bills serve no medical purpose, instead relying on inflammatory language and unrealistic hypotheticals to stigmatize both doctors and patients. And after all that, they still can't move the public in their minds. The coronavirus pandemic also provided many states with a convenient excuse to ban abortion for a time by declaring that the procedure was non-essential. As a result, for several weeks in March and April, the status of abortion access was unclear for anyone seeking care in those states attempting to ban the procedure. Arkansas initially banned it entirely, but then said people could have an abortion if they had a COVID-19 test within 48 hours prior to the procedure, even though the tests were not widely available. Lengthy litigation in Texas during April meant the availability of abortion there changed nearly daily. In Alabama, Iowa, Kentucky, Ohio, and Oklahoma all tried to use the pandemic as an excuse to ban abortion with varying degrees of success. However, these recent GOP attempts to restrict and ban abortions have done little to change the fact that most Americans believe abortion should be legal, available, and safe. Ashraf Khalil and Nathan Elgren of the Associated Press bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Almost as soon as the towering black fencing was erected last week to seal off Lafayette Park, the barrier became an art gallery and a sounding board for the demonstrators protesting years of black deaths at the hands of police officers. Now, with much of the temporary fencing around the White House coming down, there is an effort to preserve hundreds of pieces of instant American history. Both the Washington, D.C. government and several museums in the Smithsonian Network have expressed an interest, but for now, volunteers on the scene are working to gather up the items and keep them safe. We're trying to be as gentle as we can with everything, said Natalie Casey Sanger, a D.C. resident. I've heard some people express hopes for long-term plans, but 
nothing concrete. Casey Sanger said volunteers started removing almost everything from the fence late Tuesday night out of concern that it would suddenly be taken down early Wednesday morning. The National Park Service originally told the AP that most of the fencing would be dismantled Wednesday, but it later reversed course. I wonder who made them. In a statement Wednesday night, the Park Service said the Secret Service, who Trump calls the SS, was continuing to remove the temporary fencing around Lafayette Park and the public will have access to Lafayette Park beginning on June 11th. That's today. Some fencing will remain around damaged areas while the Park Service makes repairs. On the other southern side of the White House, parts of the temporary fencing were also being dismantled. Hundreds of the signs and posters that hung on the fence sealing off the park to the north of the White House have now been moved across the street and taped to the walls of a construction site or strung together and hung from trees lining the street. At volunteer medical tents, the call went out for more string to continue hanging up the poster art. The suddenly bare fence caused some initial confusion among visitors. When we first approached, we were surprised that we didn't see any signs on the fence as we did on television, and we wondered, you know, did they take them down because they didn't want them removed or destroyed? A resident who brought her seven-year-old daughter asked, and as we walked further down, you could see that all of the signs were still here preserved. And we are thankful for that because we still have the opportunity to see it. And it is, is an amazing thing to experience. The fence was erected late at night on June 1st, a few hours after park police and other security forces, Secret Service security forces, used smoke bombs, pepper pellets, and officers on horseback to violently clear peaceful protesters so Trump could stage a brief photo op in front of St. John's, the historic church that had been lightly damaged in the protests. From signs and portraits to dozens of popsicle stick crucifixes, visitors immediately turned the fence into an integral part of an open-air protest space that the city government quickly renamed Black Lives Matter Plaza. The messages, signs, and artwork almost blotted out the view of the White House behind the fence. On June 5th, visitors tied balloons and homemade birthday cards to the fence for what would have been the 27th birthday of Breonna Taylor, an emergency medical technician who was killed by police in March in her home in Louisville. And those cops lied. She was shot eight times. Woken up in the middle of the night, sleeping. She was an EMT. Her boyfriend, a legally allowed uh, firearms owner, thought they were being attacked by intruders. Yeah, they were. And they killed her in her bed, and she staggered in the hallway and bled to death from eight bullet wounds. And they lied on the report and said she was uninjured. And those cops are still getting paid. How is that? How is that? We better get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetroodsRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, a love letter to TV and radio. Director Andrew Patterson's debut, The Vast of Night, harkens back to an earlier era. Designed to look like an episode of the cult classic The Twilight Zone, complete with a Rod Serling sound alike. Even more so, it's a nod to the medium that preceded TV, radio, in the era when it was truly the lifeblood of the community, especially in small towns. Set in 1950s New Mexico, in a fictional place that's hinted to be not far from top secret government goings-on, the movie tells the story of two high school 
homeschoolers, Everett, a local radio announcer operator as they used to be called, and Faye, a junior telephone switchboard operator. She begins hearing a strange noise that is interfering with both the radio broadcasts and telephone calls. Everett, seeking explanations from listeners, airs a caller who mentions that he had heard that sound years before and suggests that it involves a government project out in the desert. Anyone with the vaguest notion of pop culture will quickly pick up on where this one is headed, despite its modest budget, much of which is saved for an impressive visual grand finale. While the plot isn't very original, the way that it is shot and presented is refreshing. Simply put, Patterson makes the most of what he has. With no star actors, he manages to make something as seemingly mundane as radio interference to build an atmosphere of suspense and intrigue. The key here is moderation. Even the nods to the 50s, like the hairdos, the cat's eyeglasses, and tail fin cards are subtle enough to work without ever feeling over the top. The Vast of Night is a wonderful debut that could well be a surprise hit in the COVID summer movie season. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Suzanne Bard. Stay-at-home orders due to COVID-19 have been in place for several months now. For many parents, these requirements have led to a balancing act between working from home and attending to their children. Families have been forced to adapt to unexpected disruptions in their daily routines, and kids have been isolated from their peers, all of which can affect their psychological well-being. I think even though everyone is having some experience of loss and grief over not getting to do the things they're used to doing, we're going to see a lot of individual differences in how kids react. University of Washington psychologist Liliana Lengua. She says a child's temperament has a big influence on how they respond to stressful events. Kids who were already prone to being fearful or anxious might be especially anxious about getting sick or about family members getting sick. Very sociable kids may struggle more with social isolation than others do, and kids who are easily frustrated may become even more so. But despite these differences, Lengua says parents can help their kids cope by validating their feelings. Validating really means hearing, listening, recognizing what the source of that person's emotional experience is, and recognizing the truth of it. It's also important to check in with kids about the very real fears they face. Inviting children to talk openly and sometimes showing our own vulnerability can be helpful in facilitating that conversation. For teens, being cut off from friends can be especially challenging. And I think all parents can do at that point is validate their youth. This is awful. This is hard. I know this is really a loss for you. And just recognize those feelings and not dismiss them. But how can a parent tell if their child might be developing more serious mental health issues? Lengua suggests keeping an eye out for big changes from their normal selves. Has this gotten really so extreme that it's interfering with that child's functioning or their relationships? For example, more intense and frequent emotional breakdowns, an inability to enjoy anything, or withdrawal from the family. In those cases, Lengua recommends seeking professional guidance, which could start with a family pediatrician. As the school year finishes and we head into summer, uncertainty remains. We don't have an end point. We don't know even what fall is going to look like. We're going to have to find more tools and skills for keeping up our spirits, for keeping up our resilience. One crucial way parents can help their kids? I think parents really need to take care of themselves, too. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Suzanne Bard. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For an expectant mother, taking care of her developing baby means taking good care of herself. One way she can do this is by ensuring she gets vaccinated. If a woman is or might be pregnant during flu season, it's especially important to get her annual flu shot, preferably before the end of October. In addition, women should be vaccinated against whooping cough during the third trimester of each pregnancy. Failure to get vaccinated places both mother and baby at increased risk for serious complications of these infections, 
including hospitalization and even death. If you're pregnant or planning to get pregnant, ask your healthcare provider when you should get your vaccines. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. It doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution and you'll get a wondrous pair of Netroots Radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. The preview of the 2020 voter suppression that we just witnessed should horrify everyone who believes that the right to vote is a right. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. On June 9th, when Georgia held its statewide primary elections, voting machines were missing or malfunctioning. Would-be voters had to wait online at the polls for three to five hours in 90-degree heat, so many left without voting. There was a shortage of poll workers, and the poll workers who were at their stations did not receive adequate training on the new voting machines and were not given the passwords necessary to operate them. Security on those machines is lacking, and polling places ran out of provisional ballots early in the day. The worst problems were in Atlanta, but every area in the state was affected, and predominantly black areas suffered the most. Prior to Election Day, voters who had requested absentee ballots months in advance never received them. In November 2020, the Georgia elections matter a lot. Georgia's electoral votes are not a given, and unusually, the state will elect both of its United States senators so that control of the U.S. Senate may depend on the vote in Georgia. Lessons learned from this debacle? The Georgia Secretary of State, who is in charge of elections, accepted no blame whatsoever for the voting meltdown and made no promise to do any better in November. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1969. That was the day that labor leader John L. Lewis died. Born to a Welsh-American coal mining family in Iowa, Lewis became the leading champion of industrial unionism in the 1930s. He served as president of the United Mine Workers of America from 1920 until 1960. He was the founder of the Congress of Industrial Organizations. The CIO split off from the American Federation of Labor with the aim of organizing the thousands of workers who powered the U.S. industrial machine. Some public officials and the media accused the CIO of being infiltrated with communism. In 1937, Lewis delivered a speech in Washington, D.C. to deny these claims. The speech captured Lewis's commitment and passion for industrial labor organizing. He declared, quote, the workers of the nation were tired of waiting for corporate industry to right their economic wrongs, to alleviate their social agony, and to grant them their political rights. Despairing of fair treatment, they resolved to do something for themselves. They therefore have organized a new labor movement conceived within the principles of the National Bill of Rights and committed to the proposition that the workers are free to assemble in their own forms, voice their own grievances, declare their own hopes, and contract on even terms with modern industry for the sale of their only material possession, their labor. He went on to say, quote, under the banner of the Committee of Industrial Organization, American labor is on the march. Its objectives today are those it had in the beginning, to strive for the unionization of our unorganized millions of workers and for the acceptance of collective bargaining as a recognized American institution. 
This is Solidarity News on Radio Labour. This is a Radio Labour report recorded on Thursday, June 11, 2020. I'm Simmery Ainsborough. There is growing evidence that women are being hit the hardest by COVID-19. That's why Public Services International recently conducted a webinar about what can be done to help women during the pandemic. The PSI is the organization which represents national public service unions at the world level. The webinar was moderated by Marie Clark Walker, the Secretary-Treasurer of the Canadian Labour Congress. The CLC represents most unions in Canada. Ms. Clark Walker was one of the labour leaders who was instrumental in getting a new global law against violence and harassment in the world of work. The law is Convention 190 of the International Labour Organization. The ILO is the United Nations agency focused on matters of work in the world. A year ago, we were just beginning our second year of negotiations on Convention 190, a convention that deals with violence and harassment in the world of work. While it was a successful exercise in developing an instrument, it took a lot of work, a lot of consultation, and a hell of a lot of social dialogue. Today, we're feeling the effects of COVID, and we know that it's not gender neutral. Women are at the forefront of the pandemic in so many ways, and the issue of gender-based violence is there with all of us. Globally, women make up about 70% of care workers who are currently on the front line. They also make up the majority of those workers now deemed essential. Those working in the food retail outlets, grocery stores, pharmacies, the postal workers, those who are cleaning our public spaces, our hospitals, waste collectors, amongst others. And even before the crisis, the dominant picture for women's paid work was that of low wages, little or no labor protection, poor working conditions, including lax or no occupational health and safety, and a lack of job security and social protections. Let's also not forget that the majority of the women workers globally are in the informal sector. Since the beginning of the various lockdowns, we've heard, seen, and felt the impact on women around the world. The frontline workers who have endured violence and harassment from customers, clients, and the general public. The poor working conditions, the increase in the amount of unpaid work that we already do the live-in caregiver or domestic worker who's working in the home of her abuser, the women with children who are also home due to school closures, having to deal with demands from the children, having to deal with demands from their partner, from family and work. We know that the incidence of gender-based and domestic violence has also increased with COVID. There have been reports of increasing incidents of violence and harassments against staff of frontline that are in frontline services, including health and social care workers, food, retail, transport workers. We've heard from informal workers who have also faced increased violence from authorities, having their goods destroyed or confiscated. For many women, staying home does not mean staying safe. Those who have lost their jobs, those who are on layoff, and women who are working from home are all at increased risk for domestic violence. Lockdown measures resulted in women being confined with violent partners. It also has meant isolation, uncertainty, financial stress, and fear about the future. All of those things which are exacerbating tensions within households and therefore increasing the likelihood of violence. During the C-190 negotiations, we spoke about all of this and what would be needed to ensure a world free from violence and harassment. The instrument provides ways to deal with all of this. You can hear an extended version of the webinar on women and the pandemic on the Radio Labour website. I'm Simari Ainsborough. Thank you for listening.
Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 61 degrees Fahrenheit, expected to be a tad cooler than yesterday, maybe uh, 79 to 81. Clouds and some sun this morning with more clouds for this afternoon. Winds will be out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Partly cloudy early this evening, followed by cloudy skies overnight. Lows in the mid-50s, winds out of the, out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then tomorrow, only a high of about 68 to 70. Considerable cloudiness with occasional rain showers. And uh, winds will be out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Uh, rain expected to bring uh, just about a quarter of an inch Friday and Saturday. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County of Southern Oregon have now spiked overnight from 71 to 77. We are one of the states that are seeing a spike, a terrible spike in cases of infection from coronavirus because a bunch of idiots decided that Kate Brown was a dictator and they're going to show her. The virus doesn't care about your geopolitical stance or your concept of what reality is. Not one whit. Barometric pressure. Oh, I'm sorry. It skipped. Uh, grass pollen is very high. The air quality index in the Southern Oregon region is good at 18 parts per million. And the daytime UV index is very high at nine. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.03 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles and relative humidity is at 75%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 67 and mostly cloudy with coronavirus and civil unrest. France which is really what Paris thinks it is, all of France. But in Paris right now, it is 75 and sunny with coronavirus and civil unrest. Rome is 63 with rain and coronavirus and civil unrest. Kiev is 92 and fair with coronavirus. I don't know about the civil unrest. I just don't. Kabul is 77 and fair with coronavirus, and I would say a continuous 25, 50-year war might be considered in some parts civil unrest. Hong Kong is 80 degrees and clear with ongoing civil unrest coupled with the coronavirus. Tokyo is 75 and cloudy with coronavirus, a little civil unrest. Sydney, Australia is 56 and partly cloudy with coronavirus, and they are protesting because Black Lives Matter. San Francisco, California is 55, mostly cloudy, mostly with a spike in coronavirus and civil unrest because of police brutality and racism. And New York, New York is 77 degrees Fahrenheit, cloudy with coronavirus and civil unrest to stop systemic racism in America. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. And these people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live on the world. Anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The United States is planning to withdraw troops from Germany because Americans are against paying too much for other countries' security. 
the outgoing U.S. ambassador said late yesterday, Wednesday. Trump has ordered the U.S. military to remove 9,500 troops from Germany, a senior U.S. official said last Friday. The move would reduce the U.S. contingent to 25,000. Universally despised Richard Grinnell, who resigned as U.S. ambassador to Germany on June 1st, told Bild Live late on Wednesday yesterday American taxpayers no longer feel like paying too much for the defense of other countries. There will still be 25,000 soldiers in Germany. That's no small number, he added, according to a German translation of his remarks. The troop move is the latest twist in relations between Berlin and Washington that that have often been strained during Trump's presidency. Trump has pressed Germany to to raise defense spending and accused Berlin of being a captive of Russia due to its partial reliance on Russian energy. Oh, really now? Trump's decision to cut U.S. troop levels in Germany blindsided a number of senior national security officials, according to five sources familiar with the matter, and the Pentagon had yet to receive a formal order to carry it out because maybe they're not checking their Twitter feed. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, reste toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Joanna Pluchinska and Idris Ali of Reuters bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Fort Trump appears to have fallen. Poland's grand proposal in 2018 to name a military base in honor of Donald Trump in return for him placing a permanent presence there has crumbled amid disputes over how to fund the deployment and where to garrison the soldiers. A U.S. official familiar with the matter said the idea had been doomed from the start. There is no Fort Trump. On June 12th of last year, Trump agreed with the Polish president, Duda, beside him at the White House to send 1,000 more troops to his NATO ally, bolstering his defenses against Russia to the east and cementing bilateral ties. Many officials called the project Fort Trump, although the name was never official and the idea of building a new base for the troops was soon dropped a year on. Government officials in Washington and Warsaw say they still cannot agree where the troops should be stationed and how much of the multi-billion dollar deployment Warsaw should fund, because apparently we're a mercenary army now here in America. We're for hire. Poland wants to put them close to its eastern border with Russia's ally Belarus, but on past form, this is certain to to antagonize Russia, and Washington would prefer to deploy them further west because Trump still owes a lot of vig to Vlad. Warsaw initially talked of contributing $2 billion, already a challenge now that the coronavirus has dented its economy, but the U.S. wants it to pay more. Then there is the legal status of U.S. troops permanently stationed in Poland for the first time. Currently, around 4,500 troops are regularly rotated there. And since Congress controls the purse strings and Trump wants to be a dictator, you know where this is going. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. No Fort Trump! And we, uh, but you do know that Netroots Radio will broadcast on and we'll meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. And don't we deserve it? So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 